Hi guys, I hope you're doing very well and welcome to this new video. In this video, we're pretty much going to be looking at hernias. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at hernias. So if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. The main focus about this lecture is actually going to dwell much on inguinal hernias more than any other hernias. We will do other kinds of hernias such as umbilical, epigastric, diaphragmatic, and hiatal hernias in other videos. So here's a warm-up question. This is a true or false question. Inguinal hernias, A, indirect hernia is more common than direct hernia. B, strangulation is more common with direct inguinal hernias than with indirect hernias. C, Obstruction is more common with indirect inguinal hernias than direct hernias. Option D, direct hernia is likely to protrude through Hasselbeck's triangle. Now, what exactly is a hernia? I often get a lot of definitions from different kinds of students about what hernia is. Now, remember that a hernia is just pretty much a protrusion of a viscous or part of a viscous through the wall of its containing cavity. Notice how I haven't used the word abnormal because the, the, if you imply that it's an abnormal protrusion, it means that there would be a normal protrusion. So just think of a hernia as just a protrusion of a viscous or part of the viscous through the wall of its containing cavity. Now the hernias are going to be consisting of a hernial sac as well as a neck. Now the abnormal opening may either be artificial or it may be natural, meaning that there is an area of weakness or disruption of the fibromuscular tissue of the body. Hernias can occur pretty much everywhere in the body, but they are very, very common in the brain after head injury, through the muscle uh, or in the muscle through fascial coverings, especially internally in the abdomen, that's your internal hernias, or externally through a weak opening Oh, that's, for example, in inguinal as well as femoral hernias. Or it could be through an abnormal opening, meaning an incision or hernia in the abdomen. 75 to about 85% of abdominal wall hernias are going to be groin hernias. That's why I'm going to discuss those in this lecture. And 15% of them, of males, actually would develop groin hernias. 5% would develop, 5% uh, of females would develop groin hernias. I remember that inguinal hernia is by far the most common type of hernia, going to be accounting for roughly around 73%. That's only because of the anatomy in the area. And this is obviously going to be weaknesses that are going to be present, especially in the deep ring and the other structures of the spermatic, not rather the spermatic cord, but rather the inguinal canal. Then in femoral hernias, you're going to be accounting for about 17%. Umbilical hernias are going to be counting for 8.5%. Then the others are going to be accounting for 1.5%. The second most common type of hernia is also known as an incisional hernia, where you get an, a surgery that has happened, and then, of course, viscous or part of the viscous protrudes through that surgical opening. Now, what are some of the risk factors? Just remember two things. It may either be increased intra-abdominal pressure. This is specifically for your groin hernias or your inguinal hernias or a weakness in the wall. So things that can cause an increase in intra-abdominal pressure include things like straining, weightlifting, chronic constipation. It could be habitual or it could be rect uh, rectal strictures. 
chronic cough like TB, chronic bronchitis, uh, bronchial asthma, emphysema. It could be urinary causes like old age, such as the BPH or carcinoma prostate in the young individuals, such as the stricture of the urethra, and in the very young, things like phimosis and stenosis. Of course, it may be due to ascites. And then weakness may be associated with obesity, pregnancy, and the pelvic anatomy, especially with femoral hernias in females. They may also be smoking, a previous surgery, for example, an appendectomy through McBurney's incision that may injure the ilioinguinal nerve that can cause right-sided direct inguinal hernias. In some cases, there may be some familial collagen disorders such as prune belly syndrome. Acquired herniation is also probably due to collagen deficiency, which is referred to as a metastatic emphysema of Reed. Then an, an indirect inguinal hernia can occur in a congenital preformed sac, for example, remains of a process as vaginalis, and of course, the chances of um, it being bilateral is about 60%. Now, what are the parts of the hernia? Remember that hernias are going to be comprising of a covering, a sac, as well as contents. When you talk about the covering, it's pretty much the layers of the abdomen through which the sac is going to pass through. And of course, the sac itself is just this diverticulum or this outpouching of the peritoneum, which has a mouth, a neck, a body, and a fundus. Then the neck may either be narrow or it may be wide. Those that have a narrow neck, for example, in the indirect inguinal hernias, these have a high risk of strangulation as compared to those that have a wide neck, for example, with the direct inguinal hernias. And of course, the body of the sac is thin in infants. Now, depending on the contents, you may refer to different types of hernias by different names. For example, if you have omentum in the hernia, um, sac, you're going to refer to that as an omentocil or as an epiploicil. This is going to be quite difficult for you to reduce this kind of uh, sac initially, but then, um, I mean, initially it would be very easy, then later on it becomes very, very difficult to reduce. Then, if it's intestine, it's referred to as an enterocil. This is usually small bowel, so you will get uh, gurgling sounds when you try and reduce that. Then, of course, sometimes it, it's large bowel, which is difficult to reduce the sac initially, but then it, it becomes easier as more of the contents return to the abdomen. You may have a Richter's hernia, where you have a portion of circumference of bowel that's present in the content. Then, of course, a, if you have a bladder, a part of the bladder, you refer to that, which is re, usually the posterior wall. It forms the posterior wall of the sac. You refer to that as a sesocele. You may sometimes have ovaries or fallopian tube. You may have a Meckel's diverticulum. We call that as Litter's hernia. Do not confuse Litter's hernia with Richter's hernia. In some cases, the in the inguinal hernias, you may have a vermiform appendix. You refer to that as amiand hernia. And of course, it should not be confused with the Degaringiot type of hernia where you have an appendix in a femoral hernia. Degaringiot is going to be referring to a femoral hernia. Amiandis is going to be referring to a vermiform appendix in an inguinal hernia. Now, how exactly do we classify hernias? We may classify them clinically, it may classify them etiologically according to the contents, and even according to the anatomical classification. Now, clinically, this largely depends on whether you're going to be able to reduce the hernia or you can't reduce the hernia. So, largely, you're going to be having your reducible hernias where they can either return back to their cavity on their own spontaneously or by the patient or by the surgeon. Now, if it's in the intestines, remember these are going to reduce with gurgling sounds. It's very difficult to reduce the first portion. And of course, the omentum will feel doughy and it's difficult to reduce the last portion. Then of course, you get an expansile impulse when they cough. So when you put your finger and you're palpating on this patient and you ask them to cough, you'll feel that impulse. It's very, very important. And of course, it may be irreducible or incarcerated. So where now the contents can actually not, cannot return to the abdomen. And this is due to many reasons. One, it could be due to a narrow neck. The second reason, it could be due to adhesions. The third reason is that it could be due to overcrowding. Now, irreducibility is actually going to predispose to strangulation. Do not confuse irreducible hernias with strangulated hernias. Now, when you talk about strangulated hernias, which is usually a complication of an irreducible hernia, where you have obstruction to the blood flow. 
And remember, whenever the, the blood flow is obstructed, there is going to be swelling, it's going to be tender, it's going to be tense, and the cough, and the cough impulse will be absent. And most of the times, you, you do get features of intestinal obstruction. Now, features of intestinal obstruction may be absent in cases of omentosils, uh, Richter's hernia, and even Litter's hernia, but you will get the features of tenderness, tenseness, as well as swelling. Then, of course, the irreducible hernia could sometimes be obstructed. The bowel inside could be obstructed, but the blood supply is not interfered with. So you refer to that as an obstructed hernia. Then in some cases, you may have an inflamed hernia, which is due to inflammation of the contents of the sac, for example, an appendicitis or salpingitis. So here, the hernia is going to be tender, but it's not tense. And of course, the overlying skin would be red and, and edematous. So that's our... Uh, clinical classification. Then you have an etiological classification which is largely divided into congenital causes which are common. Here you have a defect uh, that's going to be occurring and a preformed sac. And of course clinically this may present later on uh, during um, childhood as the uh, precipitating factors are going to become much more likely. And of course in acquired types of hernias this is secondary to any other cause that is going to raise the intra-abdominal pressure that will lead to a weakness of areas like, for example, in the direct type of inguinal hernias. And of course, it can be classified according to contents. We already talked about this, where we talked about omentocil, which has omentum, enterocil, which has intestines, cystocil, which has a urinary bladder, litter's hernia, which has a Meckel's diverticulum. And take note that a litter's, litter actually described Meckel's diverticulum in a hernia about 81 years before Meckel was actually born and actually discovered the Meckel's diverticulum. And of course with the Richter hernia is part of the bowel. And of course if you have the bowel, if you have two adjacent loops forming like a W-shaped loop inside the hernia sac, you refer to that as a Meidel's hernia, where you have a hernia sac with a very tight neck. So these are very at a high risk of strangulation. Let me just um, show you a blackboard here so that we can see exactly what I am talking about. So let's say here you have your opening, right? And then on the inside there you have a loop of bow which is forming like a, a, a W. So it's it's like a W in this fashion like that. Okay, so you have this loop of bow that's going to be trapped here at the very very narrow neck and at this, at this portion of bow then there's going to be ischemia that is happening here. So it means that all this portion of bowel is going to die from here up until here. All this portion here is going to die and become ischemic. I hope that makes sense. I hope I, my drawings make sense anyways. So coming back to this, so we have these two loops of bowel that are incarcerated. And then of course there may be some strangulation that may occur as you compress on the mesenteric vessels at the neck of the sac. Then of course you may have a sliding hernia which contains partly extraperitoneal structures for example, the cecum or the sigmoid colon, such that the hernia sac is not totally surrounded, surround the contents, or in other words, uh, the viscous forms part of the wall. Then of course, anatomically, we may classify hernias according to where we find them. We may have the abdominal wall hernias, which are very common. We may have internal hernias and other hernias. Abdominal hernias, remember inguinal hernias by far the most common, which we'll talk about in detail in this lecture. Then we have the femoral hernias, epigastric hernias, embolical hernias, paraembolical hernias, incisional hernias. Then there is a special type of hernia which is known as a spigillian hernia, which is found along the line of spigillia. Now remember that the muscle that you find right here in the center, the six-pack muscle, is referred to as a rectus abdominis. So if we look at the outer border of the rectus abdominis there, there's going to be a line that's going to be there. Now halfway the distance, okay, halfway the distance from the umbilicus to the pubic symphysis over there, half the distance along the lateral border of this rectus abdominis muscle, that's where you refer to as your line of spigilia. That's where the spigillian hernia is actually going to be coming out from the same line. And of course the swelling is going to be diffuse and it's quite difficult to palpate as it's going to be covered by external oblique muscle, then of course it may be identified by its position above and medial to the location of the inguinal hernias. Then of course the internal hernias may be 
diaphragmatic, hiatal or congenital, mesenteric or mental. Then of course others include obturator hernias, lumbar hernias. And here's a schematic to show you the different types of locations about where the hernias actually are. So you may pause the video to actually look at it. Now remember that there is a process that's known as a, a herniography where you inject contrast into uh, contrast material into the peritoneal cavity and you take films in the supine position and the prone positions. Then of course this is to diagnose protrusion of the peritoneal sac. So you call this as a herniograph. And of course it was used earlier on to diagnose undescended testes. That's your cryptokidism. Now how do we manage hernias? So remember we pretty much want to assess the hernia for severity of symptoms with the risk of complications, so the type and the size of the neck, those that have a narrow neck, for example, the indirect hernias, are at high risk of strangulation. And of course, we also want to assess the ease of repair, so the size and the location, and the likelihood of success. So the size, uh, and of course, the loose of right of a board. Then we want to assess the patient for fitness, for surgery, because we, want, we don't want to take someone that's very old to surgery or they're frail, they won't really survive the surgery. And of course, the impact of the hernia on their lifestyle, their job, and their hobbies. And of course, the principles of surgery, you may perform a herniotomy where we just simply excise the hernial sac, or we may perform a herniography where we actually repair the defect. This is one of the common procedures that we do locally. And of course, we may do a hernioplasty, which is ideal, where we excise the sac and repair the, de the defect. Now, we'll come into one of the most common types of hernias, which happens to be our inguinal hernia. Now remember that this is actually the most common complaint in terms of hernias most occurring in men. It is twice as frequent as the femoral hernias and 90% of inguinal hernias are going to be occurring in males. Then they're going to be occurring at any age. So in children, they're generally going to be associated with some developmental disorders. For example, a persistent processus vaginalis or testicular maldescent. Then in the young adult males, they are related to congenital defects such as a, a persistent a processus and then they may also be precipitated from other things that may are going to be increasing intra-abdominal pressure or those that are causing straining. Now this is where the meat of the discussion actually lies, the surgical anatomy of the, of the inguinal canal. Now remember that the inguinal canal in females, it may go by the name of the canal of NAC. So you may refer to it as the canal of NAC. In males, you just pretty much call it as the inguinal canal. So the opening point that you have to remember here is that your inguinal canal is going to be an oblique tunnel or an oblique passage in the lower part of the abdominal wall, about 3.5 to about 4 centimeters long. So 3.5 to 4 centimeters long, situated above the medial half of the inguinal ligament. So it's going to be extending from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring. So keep in, keep in mind that there are two landmarks. The beginning of this tunnel is going to be the superficial, or rather the deep inguinal ring. The end of this tunnel is going to be the superficial inguinal ring. The tunnel itself, so you can just, in simple words, you may think of the inguinal canal as just simply an oblique tunnel in the lower abdominal wall that connects the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring and is about 3.5 to 4 centimeters long. I think that's a very, very simple definition to keep in mind. Now, I've introduced two things here. I've introduced a superficial inguinal ring, I've introduced a deep inguinal ring. But first, before I talk about the superficial inguinal ring and the deep inguinal ring, I want us to first establish a few landmarks. So we have our pelvic bone, and you have your anterior superior iliac spine over there, which is part of the pelvis. Then, of course, you have our pubic tubercle over there. Now, there is a ligament that is going to be running from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. Now, this ligament that runs from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle is referred to as the inguinal ligament. Or you can refer to, the, to it as Poupart's ligament. So that's going to be our lower border of, of course, the external oblique aponeurosis. So there, there is a thickening of the external oblique aponeurosis because remember that the muscles that are found on the lateral lower side of the abdomen, 
superficially you have your external oblique then you have your internal oblique then you have your transversus abdominis or your transverse abdominal muscle then so the the superficial muscle has of course a thickening in its lower border which is referred to as your your inguinal ring or your pull parts ligament that's going to be extending from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle i hope you have that in mind okay now there is something that's known as the midpoint of the inguinal ligament and the mid inguinal point those are the two points that i want you to keep in mind the midpoint of the inguinal ligament and the mid inguinal point they are different things now i'll explain the midpoint of the inguinal ligament first so if we look at the inguinal ligament we already established that it's coming from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle so halfway of the inguinal ligament there you refer to that as the midpoint of the inguinal ligament so half the point from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle you call that as your mid inguinal point now if you if you go in that area just a few centimeters above you're going to be finding your deep inguinal ring that's what's going to be coinciding with your deep inguinal or rather your superficial inguinal ring not your, your deep inguinal ring but rather your superficial inguinal ring then that, that's what's going to be coinciding with your superficial inguinal ring right now remember that this superficial inguinal ring is pretty much going to be a defect that's going to be there in your external oblique aponeurosis now remember that the superficial inguinal ring is triangular in shape it's not really a circle it's not really a ring it's it's like triangular in shape so it has a, a supramedial cruise and it has an inferior lateral cruise now normally this ring should not allow your little finger to go through so sometimes it may be abnormally uh, large or the defect there may be a defect in this area such that your little finger can go through especially in the hernias that are almost complete hernias then of course now if you look at from the anterior superior iliac spine to halfway the distance now to the pubic symphysis remember that the, the two bones of the pelvis the pelvis are going to be fusing at the pubic symphysis so from the pubic symphysis to the anterior superior iliac spine half the distance there you refer to that half distance as your mid inguinal point so remember this is very different from the midpoint of the inguinal ligament so you refer to this as the mid inguinal point now this mid inguinal point is going to be corresponding somewhere to the deep inguinal ring so it's u-shaped and then it's going to be a defect in the transversalis fascia the fascia that's going to be covering the transversus abdominis so this is going to be about 1.25 centimeters above the inguinal ligament and of course this is going to be corresponding to the point of the mid inguinal point so the, the tunnel that's going to be joining these two points is what is going to be referred to as your inguinal canal i hope you have these landmarks and you understand these landmarks that's why i'm taking my time on this aspect now what exactly is going to be consisted in the same inguinal canal they are pretty much only two contents just imagine two contents in the inguinal canal two contents i wonder why students have so much trouble the first content of course is in males you're going to be having your spermatic cord in females you're going to be having your round ligament of the uterus now remember that in males the testes developed from the posterior abdomen and eventually descended and passed through the inguinal canal to eventually settle in the scrotum so that's why you have your spermatic cord and your ilioinguinal nerve in females you have the ilioinguinal nerve and the round ligament of the uterus then of course what are the contents of the spermatic cord it has nerves it has blood vessels it has uh, of course the arteries and the veins and now of course it has uh, some lymphatics so you have your your vas deferens which is of course the tube that's going to be carrying these sperms then you have some arteries you have three predominant arteries you have the artery to the vas deferens you have the testicular artery and you have the cremasteric artery so three arteries then of course you have nerves 
So you have your sympathetic plexus of nerves, which are around the arteries to the vas. And you also have the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve, which is L1, L2. You also have the pampiniform plexus of veins. And of course, the remains of the process as vaginalis. These are the contents of the spermatic cord. And of course, it has some coverings, which it gets as, as the testis is actually traveling through the layers of the abdomen. So our internal somatic fascia is actually going to be corresponding to the fascia over the transversus abdominis, the transversalis fascia. Then, of course, you have the cremasteric fascia and the external spermatic fascia, which is corresponding to the external oblique aponeurosis, the, the fibrous tissue that's covering the external oblique muscle. Then, of course, these are the contents of the inguinal canal, the contents of the spermatic cord and the coverings of the spermatic cord. Here is a, a picture of, of course, the different things that are present inside the spermatic cord and the inguinal canal. Now, what are the boundaries of this inguinal canal? Remember, you can think of it like a box. So you have an anterior wall, you have a posterior wall, you have a superior wall, and you have an inferior wall. It's very easy if you start from the bottom going up. So if you start from the bottom, you have your inguinal ligament or your ligament of pupart. Remember that this is going to be coming from your anterior superior iliac spine to your pubic tubercle. Then of course, so on the floor, you have the inguinal ligament. Now, if we come now superiorly, the roof, there are some arching fibers, which are pretty much going to be fusion of the internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis. So they form a tendon, which is known as a conjoint tendon. The conjoint tendon is what is forming the roof of the inguinal canal. So you have the conjoint tendon, which is a fusion of the arching fibers of the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis muscle. Then inferiorly, you have your inguinal ligament. So this is what's going to be on the roof. This is what's going to be on the flow. Now, anteriorly, remember that anteriorly you have your external oblique aponeurosis, medially, and of course your conjoint muscle, which is your internal oblique and your transversus abdominis laterally. Posteriorly, you're going to be having your inferior epigastric artery. This is very, very important because it's going to help us determine whether the uh, hernia is a direct hernia or indirect hernia based on its relation to the inferior epigastric artery. You also have the transversalis fascia, and of course, you have the insertion of the conjoint tendon medially. So these are the boundaries of the inguinal canal. I hope you keep this in mind and you actually remember this anatomy. It's very easy if you think about the layers of the abdomen, or rather the, not really the layers, the, the muscles that are there in the lateral low abdominal wall. So you have, at the bottom, you have your transversus abdominis. So obviously, this should be part of the posterior wall. It should be part of the superior wall. Then of course, anteriorly, you're going to be having your internal oblique uh, muscle, which usually also fuses with your transverse abdominis. Then most superficially, you have your external oblique uh, muscle, which is pretty much going to be covered by an external oblique aponeurosis. And of course, there are some defense mechanisms of the inguinal canal that prevent hernias normally. For example, the obliquity of the tunnel itself the arching fibers of the conjoint tendon, there is a shutter mechanism of the internal oblique, there is a bow valve mechanism, which is due to contraction of the grimaster muscle, which plugs the or closes of the superficial ring. And of course, when the external oblique muscle contracts, the, the intercrural fibers of the superficial ring will pose to form what is known as a slit valve mechanism. And of course, there are some hormones that come into play. This is just the different mechanisms that are there to protect you from having inguinal hernias. You can actually read up on this. It's a very, very interesting read online. Then of course, there are some classifications of inguinal hernias. They may be classified anatomically or they may be classified according to the extent. Now, anatomical classification, you may classify them either as indirect or direct. Now, the indirect hernias are going to be coming now through the, in, the, the deep uh, inguinal ring, the internal ring. Now, how do I remember this? Indirect, it's in the ring. So that's how I remember it. Indirect, it's in the ring. So it comes through the internal ring or the, the, the deep ring. Then, of course, it's going to be moving along the cord. 
it's going to be lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. Remember when I told you about keep in mind that the inferior epigastric artery, because we'll be able to use this, so this comes lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. Now, these have a high risk of strangulation because the neck is very narrow. On the other hand, here you have your direct hernias, which are pretty much going to be arising from the posterior wall of the inguinal canal through a special triangle, which is known as your Hasselbeck's triangle. Now, what exactly is this Hasselbeck's triangle? Now, here in the midline, you have your rectus sheath. So your rectus sheath here, the lateral border of the rectus sheath is going to be forming one of the medial borders of the triangle. Then, of course, laterally, you're going to be having your inferior epigastric artery. Then, of course, inferiorly, you're going to be having your inguinal ligament. You refer to that as your Hasselbeck's triangle. So the borders of the Hasselbeck's triangle, number one, you have the lateral border of the rectus muscle. Number two, you have your inferior epigastric artery. And number three, you have your inguinal ligament. Now, the direct hernias are going to be going through the posterior wall through the Hasselbeck's triangle. Now, the sac is going to be medial to the inferior epigastric artery. Keep this in mind because they can play around with your mind on the SEQs with this concept. Now, here is a direct hernia over there um, in the circle here. Then this one that looks pyramidal is your indirect hernia. Remember that the indirect hernia is coming from the deep inguinal ring and extending all the way. It can sometimes reach the scrotum. And of course, your direct inguinal hernia is coming from the posterior wall of the inguinal canal through the Hasselbeck triangle. Then femoral hernias are rather inferior to your inguinal ligaments. The inguinal hernias are usually superior to the inguinal ligament, but they may extend into the scrotum in the case of the indirect hernias. Now, how do we classify them according to the extent? Now, it may be incomplete, so you may have a bubonosil where the sac is actually confined within the inguinal canal. You may have a funicular type where the sac actually crosses the superficial ring, but it doesn't reach the bottom of the scrotum. Or you may have a complete type where now the sac is going to be descending to the bottom of the scrotum. You call this as a complete inguinoscrotal hernia. You may sometimes have a saddle bag or a pantaloon hernia. Pantaloon is actually a French word meaning trousers. Then of course, this has a both a medial and a lateral component. Now remember that the inguinal hernias are above and medial to the pubic tubercle. The femoral hernias are going to be below and lateral to the pubic tubercle. Now here is a diagram, a schematic. So here you have your inguinal ring, your inner ring, or your deep inguinal ring, and here you have your external ring, or your superficial ring. If it's within the inguinal canal, you refer to that as a bubonosil. If it's now past the superficial ring, but it hasn't reached the testes, then you refer to this as a funicular type. If it even reaches the testes, this is referred to as a complete inguinoscrotal hernia. We'll begin with the indirect hernia because these are actually the most common variant, accounting for 65%. Now, they, they are more common in the young individuals as compared to the direct hernias, which are common in the elderly. Now, they are much more common on the right side in the first decade. than in the second decade of life, the, the incidence is actually quite equal on both sides. They are bilateral in about 30% of the cases. And remember that in an indirect hernia, this is going to be occurring when the sac develops and emerges through the deep inguinal ring and of course it passes through the inguinal canal adjacent to the spermatic cord then of course the sac is quite thin the neck is narrow this is very important because there's a risk of strangulation and of course the lateral it's lateral to the inferior epigastric artery and of course you may have a funicular type of hernia where it emerges from the external ring but doesn't reach the um, the testes, you may have a bubonosil when it's just trapped within the inguinal canal, or you may have a, a, an inguinoscrotal hernia where it actually descends to the testes, a complete inguinoscrotal hernia. Now, the coverings are pretty much from the inside out. You have the extraperitoneal tissue, your internal spermatic fascia, your cremasteric fascia, your external spermatic fascia, and of course the skin. So it may contain omentum or small bowel and has the potential to become irreducible and strangulated because the neck is, is rather thin. We already talked about the precipitating factors and we also even talked about 
these uh, d types, the co incomplete and the complete. So I won't be the horse that's already dead. Now, what are we expecting on our history? Remember that the prevalence is much more common in, in males, 25% in males, 2% in females. So 20 times much more common in females than it is in men. How is it going to present? There's going to be a dragging pain. There's going to be a swelling in the groin, which is, of course, better seen when a patient coughs or the, the stand or the strain. Then, of course, you're able to feel a cough impulse if it's not strangulated. And, of course, it may actually completely descend to the scrotum. Now, the contents may either be small bowel, large bowel, or mentum, or a combination of the three. Sometimes in females, you may have ovaries and the tubes, and may this may be the contents. And then, of course, in infants, you get a swelling when the child cries, and it's often translucent. And, of course, they're usually reducible, but they can be irreducible. They may be inflamed, they may be obstructed, and they may be strangulated. Now, how are we going to examine a patient with hernias? There are specific tests that you have to do. Very, very important. This is a very important thing that to do clinically. So there is what is known as the internal ring occlusion test. So keep in mind that you, you, you're going to be using all five of your fingers to examine a hernia. I'll explain what I mean by this. So you have your internal, uh, your internal ring occlusion test. Now remember that your internal ring is going to be found at the mid inguinal point. Now remember that the mid inguinal point is pretty much the center between your anterior superior iliac spine and your pubic symphysis. Now after after reducing the the contents, of course in a lying down position, the internal ring is going to be occluded. So you place your thumb in that region. Now when you place your thumb in the deep inguinal ring, and you ask the patient to cough. You have blocked the inguinal ring, the deep inguinal ring. Remember that if it is an indirect hernia, the indirect hernias are supposed to come out from the deep inguinal ring. But then now you have reduced the hernia, you have blocked the opening. So if a patient coughs, there will be no swelling that's going to be appearing. And the swelling only appears when you release the thumb and you ask the patient to cough, then of course the swelling will reappear. And then of course you can confirm this when they stand. And of course, if the swelling appears medial to your thumb, then it's going to be a direct hernia because these do not come out from the deep inguinal ring, but they rather come out from the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. So that's one way in which you can actually distinguish direct versus indirect hernias using your deep inguinal ring or your ring occlusion test. Now, this is going to be using the thumb. Now, moving on to the next one where you use your... your um, a little finger or sometimes your index finger but it's much more preferable if you use your little finger so you're going to now get the hernia contents and of course reduce them then of course you're going to be uh, gradually now getting your the, the examiner will get the uh, little finger then of course they will invaginate from the bottom of the scrotum and gradually pushing upwards and rotating until they enter the superficial inguinal ring now of course you ask the patient to cough now if there is an impulse on uh, where the patient cough if this touches the tip of the invaginated finger then of course this is positive for hernia and of course you may do what is known as a Zeeman's test now here the examiner is going to be placing the index finger to cover the deep inguinal ring remember that the deep inguinal ring is going to be your uh, mid inguinal point then of course the middle finger is going to be covering your superficial ring which is the midpoint of the inguinal ligament and of course your ring finger is going to be covering your saphenous opening and you pretty much ask the patient to cough or to strain down or to blow their nose then of course the impulse if the impulse is going to be felt on the index finger meaning that the finger that is covering the deep ring then that is going to be an indirect hernia again i already explained this diagram so i won't be the horse that's already dead you may also sometimes perform a head or leg raising test where the head or the leg um, is actually raised to increase the abdominal wall muscle tone you may get some bulgings on the abdomen which are known as a malgogany uh, or malgagny i don't know how you pronounce that bulgings and then of course you'll be able to see this when they perform a valsava maneuver. Then of course, also do not forget to perform an abdominal, a respiratory, a urological examination.
to ascertain the precipitating factors like chronic bronchitis, ascites, strictures, and even uh, benign prosthetic hypertrophy. You must always perform a digital rectal examination after you examine the patient for hernias. And of course, in inguinal hernias in females, there's going to be an increase in the thickness of the labium majus or the labia majora on palpation when compared to the contralateral side. You may get a silk glove sign where the index finger is evaginated across the scrotum towards the external ring and you ask the patient to cough. Then in guinal hernias, you feel it like uh, as a, a rather a slit-like sensation or silk rather like sensation. And of course, a palpation of the bulbar urethra for strictures must also be done. So you're going to be using the five fingers to conduct uh, the tests for hernias. So the thumb is used for the deep occlusion test. The index finger, the middle finger, and the ring finger are used for the Z-man test. And of course, the little finger for the superficial ring invagination test. Now, what are the rules of hernias? So never forget to examine the opposite side. Never forget to do a rectal examination. Never forget to examine the urethra and never forget to check for abdominal muscle tone. Then our differential diagnosis is obviously going to be things like your hydrocele, your undescended testes, femoral hernias, lipomas of the cord, hydrocele of the canal of neck in females, inguinal lymph node enlargement, and even a groin abscess. And of course, here are the different locations labeled on the diagram there. The investigations would order include an ultrasound of the abdomen, a chest x-ray to rule out any chronic bronchitis, and of course, tests relevant to the precipitating causes. This will largely depend on the underlying clinical history. And moving on to the direct hernias, remember that these are going to be coming out through the Hasselbeck's triangle, which has the following borders. The inferior epigastric artery laterally, the lateral border of the rectus abdominis medially, and of course the, inferior, the inguinal ligament inferiorly. Now these are going to be coming out medial to the inferior epigastric artery. They have a quite wide neck, so there's not much of a risk of strangulation in this type of hernias. Now the sac here is thick as compared to the indirect, which is a thin sac, and often the medial wall or contents of the uh, bladder may be present. And of course the Hasselbeck's triangle can be divided into a medial and a lateral half by your uh, uh, obliterated umbilical artery. That's your uh, medial umbilical ligament. And of course the direct hernias are classified as a medial or lateral depending on which part of the Hasselbeck triangle they're coming out from. Now these are going to be accounting for 10 to 15 percent of hernias. 50 percent of them are going to be bilateral. 35 percent of them are going to be uh, direct. 35 percent of the inguinal hernias. They are quite uncommon in females and in children. They are much more common in elderly because they are almost always acquired and they are due to weakening of the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. Now remember that the coverings here you're going to be having your external or your extra peritoneal tissue your transversalis fascia, the conjoint tendon. Remember that this is because it's coming from the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. And of course, you're going to be having your external spermatic fascia and your skin. Predisposing factors are quite similar, so anything that's going to be leading to your increase in intra-abdominal pressure. You may also have your malgalgony bulgings, which are those swellings on the lower abdomen. Apologies, I couldn't add images because they're rather graphical and because of YouTube's policies. But of course, you can find the images in any of my literatures that I've put out there. And of course, the direct hernias rarely descend into the scrotum and strangulation is not so common. But in long-standing cases, they may descend to the scrotum and strangulation can occur. So here's just the uh, a schematic to show you the, the sac of the direct inguinal hernias. Like that they're coming out from the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. Of course, here is your inferior epigastric artery. As you can see here, you have your um, Hasselbeck triangle. So you have your inferior epigastric artery, which is your lateral border, your inguinal ligament, which is your inferior border, then of course your lateral wall of the rectus abdominis. So this is your Hasselbeck triangle. Now the Hasselbeck triangle can be divided by your medial umbilical ligament into a lateral component here and a medial component and then the, the direct hernias can either come out from the medial component or they can come out from the lateral components. Investigations are similar to direct hernias so your ultrasound of the abdomen, chest x-ray to rule out any chronic bronchitis and of course the other tests are largely depending on the precipitating cause. Now here's the difference between the indirect and the direct hernias. Remember that indirect are common in 
any age, especially from children to adults, the direct are common in the elderly. Indirect can be sometimes associated with a pre-existing sac, a congenital defect. Direct are always acquired. Here the protrusion is through the deep ring. Here the protrusion is through the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. These tend to be piriform or oval in shape and they descend obliquely and downwards. These tend to be globular in shape and they descend directly forward. Then uh, these can be complete. Uh, descent into the scrotum on the other side, uh, descent to the scrotum is quite rare. The neck here is narrow and it's lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. The neck here is wide and it's medial to the inferior epigastric artery. Here the sac is anterolateral to the cord. Here it is posterior to the cord. The ring occlusion test is not going to show any impulse. On the other side here, the ring occlusion test does show an impulse. Of course, the swelling will be seen. And of course, the invagination test shows an impulse at the tip of the finger. On the other side here, the invagination test shows the impulse felt at the palp, so on the side, because it's coming out from the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. The Zeman test shows an impulse on the index finger, the one that's covering the deep inguinal ring. Here, the Zeman's test shows an impulse in the middle finger. Then, of course, the this is commonly unilateral, but can be bilateral. This is commonly bilateral. On this side here, the obstruction and strangulation are common. Here, it's not so common because the neck is wide. And of course, the sac here can be opened during surgery. Here, it's not, no, it's not so necessary to open the sac unless if there's an obstruction that is present. Now, remember, there is features of strangulation that can happen where you actually cut off the blood supply. Initially, the venous drainage is going to go, but the, the arteries will still be supplying. So this will further increase the edema, further increase the pressure inside this, and eventually even the arterial blood supply will be affected such that this will lead to gangrene. So there will be some severe local pain, irreducible, irreducibility of the hernias, of course tenderness. And then there may be some symptoms of small bowel obstruction, so there may be things like colic abdominal pains, nausea, vomiting, constipation. Then of course when the hernia becomes obstructed, it's possible to reduce it by manipulation, but then of course there's a risk that you may reduce it back into the abdomen such that now it's still twisted and it doesn't untwist then this carries a very high risk of um, strangulation and perforation. Then management of strangulation, pretty much want to admit the patient, push in an NG tube, then of course uh, intravenous rehydration to correct any dehydration or electrolyte imbalances, cover them on broad spectrum antibiotics before taking them to theater, catheterize them and monitor urine output, and then of course emergency surgery. Management of the inguinal hernias, pretty much ideally all hernias must be treated as electic, elective surgeries unless if they come in with uh, obstruction or they come in with strangulation. Now you may perform two uh, types of surgery. So you may perform a herniotomy where you just excise the sac and then you may sometimes repair the weakness in the posterior inguinal ligament uh, or the posterior inguinal canal wall where you have uh, a, a procedure that's known as a herniography. Then in infants, uh, these are always indirect hernias. So the internal and the external ring are almost always imposed on each other. So it's almost rather a straight tunnel here, rather than it is an oblique. And of course, laparoscopic repair in adults can sometimes be performed by certain surgeons. Then a truss, which is a device that's used to control uh, certain types of hernias, is sometimes used but it's not really satisfactory in uh, treating these patients and there's a high risk of incarceration, there's a high risk of strangulation. Hernioplasty is the ideal choice for all inguinal and groin hernias and of course a mesh is actually placed to reinforce the defect and of course prevent further herniation. So it may be a proline, uh, a polypropylene mesh rather which is going to be used to strengthen the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. And of course, a herniotomy is done prior for you to actually place the mash. Complications of hernia repair include hemorrhage, hematoma formation over the wound or the scrotum, acute urinary retention, which is frequently following bilateral repair, wound infections, hematocils, post-herniorophy hydrocele, lymphocils, chronic pain, which could be as a result of trapping the ilioinguinal nerve, hyperesthesia over the medial side of the inguinal ligament, which is due to injury to the iliohypogastric nerve. Then you may get testicular pain and swelling following atrophy, which usually means that the repair was rather too tight. 
and you of course uh, tied off the testicular artery then of course this leads to testicular atrophy which occurs with swelling when the swelling subsides then of course you may get recurrency of the hernia there's a very funny story of a hernia actually being repaired and then five minutes after the repair it actually it, it actually recurred so if it occurs within three years it's uh, referred to as early and if it's after that it's referred to as late then preoperative predisposing factors include smoking chronic cough constipation old age anemia hyperproteinemia ascites straining so if they're weight lifting we tell them to actually stop the weight lifting because this is actually a risk factor so they may be operative meaning that the tension in the sutures and the weak anterior abdominal wall it may be post-operative due to infections hematoma formation during early surgery and of course a retained sac in pantaloon type of hernia as well as straining which is why we advise patients to not lift weights after the surgery coming back to our warm-up question inguinohernias inguinohernia is more common than direct uh, i mean indirect hernia is more common than direct hernia it is true strangulation is more common with direct inguinohernia than it is with indirect remember this is the opposite so this is false obstruction is more common with indirect hernia than with direct hernia this is true direct hernia is likely to protrude through the Hasselbeck's triangle this is also true I really hope you learned a lot and I took my time to go through this lecture on inguinohernias. If you did enjoy, please subscribe to the channel, drop a like, drop a comment. Stay tuned to more topics on the channel. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu to Zambia and beyond. Until next time, bye-bye.